Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Tinka Duran. I am the director for the Preventions Programs under the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board. Um, we're excited that you all joined us on day three of three of our three-day conference. That's a lot of threes in there. Anyways, and our conference is the 2020 Great Plains Partners in Cancer Screening Conference. So thank you to those that have been with us throughout the last three days. And um, welcome to those that are new today. We appreciate it. Um, just a reminder, let's see. Hold on one second here. Um, we do want to announce, and Kelly will announce again, that the 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 winner from yesterday is i'm gonna pull it up here from the evaluation is marlene shortball so congratulations marlene we're very excited um for you and um they will be getting your i think it was an ipad or a computer ipad case um, they'll be getting that out into the mail to you. So we're excited about that. Um, and um, Kelly LeBeau is going to be our facilitator today. She, I think she's going to be able to show the next um, prize for those that complete their evaluation. So again, we'll put the evaluation up in the chat box so you guys can click on it um, at the close to the end of our presentation. Um, to be entered into the drawing, though, you need to provide your name and mailing address at the end of the form. And the Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board, which is us, um, will not have access to your name or mailing address. Only our external learning partners, Asset Inc., um, will see your survey responses. Um, so no one outside of Asset Inc. will see any identifying information. They will do the drawing for us. So please answer honestly. It will definitely help us in um making better conferences in the future um just a caveat to that this is our pilot or first time doing a virtual cancer conference so bear with us um we're learning as we go um so the next thing on the agenda to start with is we um have asked mr daryl red cloud to do the prayer for us and that I believe is Don, who well, I don't believe I know, is Don Arkinson's husband. And he has um, graciously said yes, that he will do the prayer for us. So we'll go ahead and start with that. Oh, you know what? One thing real quick before, before Daryl starts. Hi, Daryl. I just wanted to introduce my staff again. There may be new people on that haven't joined lately. And I just want to introduce the staff from the Preventions Program and they have done a lot of hard work to get these this conference going um a lot of background um work and i'm just grateful to them they all have a lot of passion for helping our people um increasing our screening rates in our tribal communities and they're a great bunch and i'm so grateful that i have them working as a team together and um just amazing group so I'm just gonna go through as I see you. And if you could wave, I just wanna introduce everybody one more time in case there's new people. So Deanna Swan, and then we have Kelly LeBeau. We have Richard Musso. We have Eugene Gallego. We have Gina Johnson. And we have Dawn Arkinson and her husband, Mr. Daryl Redcloud, who now can, um, start the prayer. Thank you very much. Again, I'd like to say uh, thank you for asking me to do this. Um, I appreciate it. And uh, on my mind today is uh, all the people that are dealing with different things that are <clears throat> affecting the health of our indigenous people, be it uh, the COVID virus, cancers of different kinds, sicknesses of different kinds, and so forth. So. Uh, uh, Please bear along with me as I make this prayer. Oh, heche tu kashi da wakantaka. Oke eche on peku kile eche wopilong keni chapi. Isha ke eche oyate kile na ukola ke chikile eche. Tokum se oyate ki here we chose on the el umpikte and now eche um oglakapi. 
Thank you. Thank you. Opila, thank you. All right. Um, so next, I will turn it over to Kelly LeBeau to introduce our keynote speaker for today and um, make sure that you're, you're an organizer, Kelly. You should be set to go. Um, the rest of us will mute and go from there. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for joining us for this third and final day of our virtual conference. My name is Kelly LeBeau, and I am the program manager for the Honor Every Woman Great Plains Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program. And it is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker for today, and that is Dr. Mary Milroy. She is a clinical professor for the University of South Dakota, Sanford School of Medicine, a former surgeon for Yankton Medical Clinic, specializing in breast cancer surgery and treatment. And she is the medical consultant for the Honor Every Woman Great Plains Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program, as well as the All Women Count Program for the state of South Dakota. Dr. Milroy has also served as the past president of the South Dakota State Medical Association and is a current member of the Policy Council. We welcome Dr. Milroy for her presentation today, Breast Cancer in Uncertain Times. Thank you. Now, if you can make it so I can share my screen, I think if that's, if you can make me a presenter, I can see my slides behind you. Okay, I think you should be good now. I think that's perfect. Okay. Oops. Okay, there we go. Let me go to start. Is that okay? Perfect. I can see it. Are you guys okay? Looks good. Okay, perfect. Well, first I want to say thank you for inviting me to speak on this very important topic. Um and uh I guess I want to thank the uh, Tribal uh, Leaders Health Board for the invitation. And I want to say a special thank you to uh, Tika Duran and Kelly LeBeau for being so well organized and really keeping me on track and on schedule. So thank you. And guiding me through this uh, go to webinar control panel, which um, is a little challenging. So thank you. Um, and um, anyway, um, this is a very important topic. And I think, let me see if I can find my slide, um, to talk some about breast cancer and, and certainly with a special emphasis on what's going on now uh, in the face of the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, I have nothing to disclose. Um, and I think this month is a good month to stop and, and take an extra look at what's going on as far as breast cancer and uh, really breast cancer awareness. Um, in order to do that, I know that there's a number of people at the meeting who are from uh, different backgrounds. And so I thought I would begin with um, a number of the questions that I am very commonly asked in, uh, in clinic by people facing breast cancer. Uh, just to kind of make sure we're all um, starting from the same uh, basis here. Uh, but I think one of the things is people say, gosh, where did this breast cancer come from? You know, we didn't used to hear about it. Now it's everywhere. Well, I think one of the things to know is that it really is not a new disease. Um, that in fact, when you go back and look at one of the earliest known uh, medical writings that we've ever found is from an Egyptian physician called Imhotep. And he wrote this in a, a medical transcript from 2625 BC. 
So nearly 5,000 years ago, this is what he wrote. Um, he said, this is a case of bulging masses I have to contend with. Bulging tumors of the breast mean the existence of swelling on the breast, large, spreading, and hard. Touching them is like touching a ball of wrappings, or they may be compared to an unripe hemet fruit, which is hard and cool to the touch. Therapy, there is none. So fortunately, I think um, we, we have come a long way since then, although we don't have all the answers yet. Um, breast cancer is a disease, and actually all cancers, not just uh, breast cancer, but it's a disease in which cells uh, lose their normal controls and they grow completely out of control. And so there are many kinds of cancers and they are usually named for the spot where the cells start to go, um, kind of go rogue. And um, so if these cells start to change in the breast, it's called breast cancer. If they change in the lungs, they're called lung cancer. And also, if cells in the breast um, become cancerous, and then they are able to metastasize and go to other places like the lungs or the liver, then they are still called breast cancer. It's breast cancer metastasized, say, to the lungs or to the liver, not lung cancer or liver cancer. It's really where they originally start is how they're named. In addition, there's many types of breast cancer. In fact, um, they're named for the portion of the breast in which they occur. And when you look at the diagram, you can see that the breast is made up of a number of different tissue types. Uh, the lobules are the glands. They're the, the um, glands that tend to make milk. The ducts tend to be just the pipes that carry milk to the nipple. Whereas we, there's also fatty cells, there's skin cells, there are uh, connective tissue supporting cells. And so there's many different kinds. And the kind of breast cancer is named for the place in the breast where it started. So um, you could have a lobular breast cancer, you could have a ductal breast cancer. And if it's in the, some of the fibrous tissue, you could even have a sarcoma. So there's a lot of different types and they are named for where they start. Breast cancer is the most common cause of cancer in women. Uh, it's second only to lung cancer, a cause of death in women. And the mortality is decreasing overall in the United States. And that is felt to be due to early diagnosis and improved systemic therapy. So overall, if we can obtain an earlier diagnosis and better treatment, uh, the mortality rate should be much decreased. And currently in the United States, there's over two and a half million breast cancer survivors. So the good news is what they uh, said in the Egyptian days in the, on papyrus where there's no treatment at all, uh, that fortunately is no longer true. The American Cancer Society publishes estimates every year, kind of estimating what they anticipate the, the different cancer rates will be for the coming year. And the estimate for breast cancer for uh, 2020 for new cases is about 279,000. Uh, and uh, as, as you can see, most of those certainly are in women. But I think an important point is that men definitely do get, uh, do get breast cancer at a lower rate. But really when you look at it, it's a, they all have a very significant uh, mortality and death rate so that it's important to educate uh, men to be aware of changes in their breast and to uh, report them quickly so that they can undergo treatment also. I gave some of the numbers uh, in South Dakota and Nebraska for, that are estimated for the coming year. The mortality rate kind of nationwide is estimated to be over 42,000, nearly 43,000. And again, most of those are in uh, women, but there are certainly some men. And when you look at the numbers, it's almost a fifth of men who develop that uh, do go on to die from it. So it's a very significant disease in men also. Um, one of the best reports I found, you know, I noticed that a lot of times uh, we kind of gather data statewide, but I did find that there's really an excellent report. And if you're looking and, and wanting 
uh, information about um, kind of the incidence and mortality of cancer among the American Indian population in South Dakota. Uh, there was a collaborative effort between the South Dakota Department of Health and the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's published in Great South Dakota was published in March of 2019 and it really is excellent and um, I'm just mainly going to talk about some of the breast cancer numbers but there are it's about a 25 page report that is uh, really excellent and in very good detail and um, covers quite a number of cancers but really what they concluded as some of their key findings as they did a very exhaustive uh, collaborative study was that in South Dakota, American Indian women are diagnosed at a later stage than other women in the state. And we know that survival rates are better with early diagnosis. So this is certainly concerning that uh, as of right now, we're seeing later stage diagnosis in American Indian women. And so uh, what they're finding is a lot of uh, white women are being uh, diagnosed at what's called in situ stage which is a pre-cancer stage. And there were um, more American Indian women who were diagnosed more at a regional stage. Regional stage means that there's some local uh, in the region lymph nodes that are positive. And you know that the, uh, certainly the survival rate changes as soon as you start getting lymph nodes involved. So that's a very significant finding. The other incidence that is uh, certainly of concern is that it looks like in American Indian women, the incidence rate is actually going up. When they looked at some of the original numbers from uh, 2006 to 2010 um, and 2009 to 2013, uh, it, the five-year adjusted incidence uh, actually seemed a little lower, but in about 2010, that changed. And so from about 2010 through 2015, it looked like uh, the American Indian women's rate was increasing and actually had surpassed uh, uh, white women in the state. They also looked at incidence and mortality rates and found that um, the uh, five-year adjusted mortality rate uh, was uh, much higher so that they um, found that uh, not only was the American Indian uh, rate higher, but it was higher in South Dakota than it was when you compared to the rest of the nation. Um, one of their other key findings was that late stage breast cancer is decreasing among white women. However, the rate is definitely increasing in American Indian women. And by late stage, that means people who present and they have cancer in lymph nodes or they have it at distant sites. Um, where it's diagnosed and cancer is also found in other areas such as bone or um, lung, liver, um, and certainly makes it a much uh, more serious, uh, more deadly disease at that stage. Um, a call to action was done, and this has certainly been integrated into uh, the South Dakota um, Comprehensive Cancer Control Program has uh, specifically looked at this and uh, certainly call to action steps are here. And um, I think one of them is to, pro to promote cancer prevention. And this is across the board. This isn't just about breast cancer, but uh, knowing that there are some cancers that we can prevent, it's very important that evidence-based strategies are implemented to prevent cancer. And some of those things include uh, reducing tobacco use and exposure, increasing proper nutrition and physical activity, and certainly promoting HPV vaccination as cancer prevention and limiting alcohol intake. Uh, promoting early detection is, again, very important, knowing that the earlier a cancer is detected, the better the outcome. And so it is imperative that um, evidence-based efforts, again, be used to promote early detection. And some of these can be um, things that we can do as uh, healthcare uh, providers and facilities are to provide client reminders, provider reminders, uh, really do provider assessment by individual and by clinic, and to try to the best we can reduce structural barriers uh, for screening, which keep people from presenting for screening. And sometimes that's making better access with things such as mobile mammography, 
extending service hours um, and eliminating some of the transportation barriers. Uh, promoting access and referral to appropriate and timely treatment again is very important to have appropriate um, referral so that people do have access to high quality cancer uh, treatment. And um, again, uh, we need to support many of the American Indian cancer survivors and caregivers. We need to uh, recognize the burden that they carry. And there's often um, cancer survivors, uh, sometimes when they're done with their treatment, they're not actually done. They often face uh, physical and psychosocial effects that go on really lifelong. And so I think we need to uh, recognize those and support them to the best that we can uh, with survivorship care plans, uh, patient navigation, uh, cancer survivorship programs, and educating our survivors and caregivers um, to help them uh, make really informed decisions. Um, I would say that um, uh, that is uh, very important and it does, I think, recognize that um, it, it's good that we take a good look and address many of those issues. So I guess it's good, a very good thing you're uh, taking this on as a topic for the, the uh, conference today. Um, when we look at risk factors, you know, if I would go and quiz people and say, um, who is most likely to get breast cancer? Uh, what I find is uh, a lot of people when quizzed, even medical students, will say, oh gosh, it's family history. When in reality, when we look at who is most likely to get breast cancer, we find that the older a person is, the more likely their cancer risk is. And uh, women certainly are more likely to get uh, breast cancer than men. But those are the only two factors, which means there are no women that are so safe they don't need to go through screening. And I hear that a lot in the clinic. People will say, oh gosh, I'm too old for a mammogram. Um, no, actually, the older you are, the more at risk you are. Or people say, gosh, there's never been anyone in my family that's had breast cancer, in which case, um, I can say, well, actually, age and sex are the most important risk factors, and that the majority of women diagnosed do not have any, what we would call, identifiable risk factors other than the, the age and sex. Um, and really, only about 15 to 20 percent of women diagnosed with breast cancer really do have a significant family history. So, in other words, all women are at risk, and we need to um, carry out education and screening to all women. There are some women who are at increased risk and we do need to identify them. So maybe we can uh, change their screening plan, but we need to start kind of this breast uh, cancer screening conversation with all women. Uh, this is kind of a long list of some of the risk factors that we look at. And really, uh, these are just risk factors, but I think all women need to be concerned about the risk of breast cancer. When we look at some of these other risk factors, it's really to identify women who carry uh, extra, like extra, extra risk. And because we may want to start their screening earlier, we may want to screen more often. We may need to add extra ways of screening such as MRIs, ultrasounds, but um, uh, to uh, uh, find that, but our risk assessment is not to find women that are so safe, they don't need to worry about it. Um, and a lot of times people say, what on earth can I do to decrease my risk? I think one thing that's important to say is, you know, when I talk to people in the clinic and they've been diagnosed with breast cancer, almost um, very commonly, women will say to me, oh my gosh, what did I do? What didn't I do? Uh, women often tend to blame themselves. When I say, you know, there are a few things we can do to decrease our risk, but basically we've never found a definite prevention. So I think women don't need to feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. Um, and uh, that uh, a lot of times, honestly, it, it is just out of the blue and it is absolutely nothing we did, could have done, should have done, might have done. Uh, sometimes it just happens. And so I think it's important to tell people, gosh, we don't know why this happens. If we knew exactly how it happened and how to prevent it, we'd probably have the Nobel Prize in medicine and we're not quite there yet. There's a lot of groups studying it worldwide, 
and it's still been pretty elusive. But I think for all cancers, there are a few things that we can do to decrease our risk, not eliminate it, unfortunately, but decrease it. And one of the things for many cancers, we find that if we um, keep a healthy weight, uh, we exercise, um, we either don't drink alcohol or alcohol intake. Um, increased alcohol intake is definitely known to increase risk of uh, cancer, particularly breast cancer. Also, if we can limit, limit or even uh, eliminate postmenopausal hormone replacement, um, that is uh, helpful. We know that estrogen progesterone um, uh, medication given after menopause can increase the risk of breast cancer. Uh, breastfeeding at least a year is felt to be protective, so that's a good thing that we can do. Healthy for us and healthy for the children. Uh, it's very important not to smoke. And it's good to have a very good conversation with your healthcare provider about your risk factors and things that you might do to decrease that. When we do our, our family history risk assessment, uh, we look primarily at close relatives, um, if we've had breast cancer uh, in multiple generations, if there are other cancers such as ovarian cancer, male breast cancer, very young onset cancers, bilateral breast cancers, uh, triple negative breast cancers, uh, people of Ashkenazi uh, Jewish ancestry. Those are a number of the people that uh, may be uh, most likely to carry actually a breast cancer gene, which would make them very high risk. And so um, they need to be identified. We need to be watching for um, people with those risk factors because at that point they benefit from being referred over to a, a genetic counselor for further discussion and uh, drawing of a family tree, uh, calculating risk and uh, maybe undergoing uh, gene testing. In the general population, um, the uh, general risk of breast cancer is about 12%, but uh, since uh, genetic mutations uh, make up about 5 to 10% of the population, we definitely know that there are, if you carry a gene, you can be up to 80 or 85% risk. So it very significantly can change um, your risk of, a, of developing um, uh, different cancers. If you're identified as a high-risk breast cancer risk person, uh, then you usually start your screening early, at least by age 25. You may want to screen every six to 12 months. You may need to add extra modalities such as a uh, MRI. There are some risk-reducing medication that people can take, and some people even go ahead and do risk-reducing surgery. I think one of the more, um, I think, well-known cases recently was most people know Angelina Jolie, and uh, her mother uh, had, was diagnosed with a breast cancer gene, and when she was um, diagnosed, um, and uh, Angelina Jolie was noted to be a BRCA2 carrier and did elect to go ahead and have bilateral mastectomy, which um, is certainly a, a kind of a, a more drastic measure, but is um, in certain cases can be uh, very life-saving. I think one of this, the very important things is that early detection and, and improved systemic therapy definitely do save lives. When you look at this as a, a, a figure that came out of the American Cancer Society uh, Facts and Figures, which is a publication that comes out every year that is on their website, uh, cancer.org, and it is free and extremely helpful with much information about many, many cancers. But I think if you look at uh, kind of that gray line that um, goes across, um, there is this gray line that represents breast cancer. And when you look at it from about 1930 all the way up to probably almost 1990, so you think, gosh, that's about 60 years, the breast cancer um, mortality rate was almost flat line. And you think of all the things that happened um, in medicine, really from 1930 to 1990, you would have hoped it got better, but that breast cancer mortality rate stayed pretty flat line. Well, what we saw was in the 1980s, 
we saw the very beginning emergence of mammography. And both the combination of mammography for early diagnosis and certainly improved systemic therapy from our medical oncology friends, uh, you can see that that line has definitely gone down. Not all lines have gone down quite as significantly, but that has, uh, I think, is good evidence that early detection uh, really does save lives. And we look at, you know, we talked about some of the survival rates uh, for breast cancer. If we can find a very early breast cancer, very early, while it's still confined to the breast, the um, SEER data looks like the five-year relative survival rate is about 99%. So I think when we talk to uh, women about the importance of screening, um, some people are almost afraid to be diagnosed, but I think we can reassure them that um, it isn't an automatic death sentence, that the earlier we can find a cancer, certainly uh, it opens up more treatment possibilities and the outcome can be extremely good. Even when the cancer has spread to some of the uh, regional area, which is mainly the lymph nodes, uh, survival rate still 86%, so really pretty, pretty good. By the time we get to distant spread, and that means that cancers that are now in the bone, the liver, uh, lungs, brain, distant areas, we recognize at that point that that breast cancer cannot be cured. Uh, sometimes it can be managed almost like a chronic disease, but the survival rate you can see is very, very significantly decreased. So our goal is certainly let's get our women in at localized stages, not distant. I think with breast cancer screening, there's certainly been a lot of controversy. And when we talk to patients, we need to be honest and address that because they, they certainly read things. They um, hear things on the radio, on television, on social media about controversy. And certainly we need to discuss pros and cons in a good um, honest, open discussion. We know that we can, uh, with early detection, we can decrease mortality. And the earlier we find a breast cancer, the more treatment options are available. We can offer uh, very small lumpectomies. Uh, we can offer uh, many different treatments, whereas sometimes late stage, the treatment options start to be a little more limited. Uh, some of the cons, I think it's good to let people know beforehand that uh, some people do get recalled. And I think when the radiologist looks, um, a, a mammogram is just a, a kind of a screening study and they wanna bring in everything. And so um, maybe as much as 10% of women who are um, having a mammogram may be asked to come back and have an extra study. They may wanna just take uh, maybe the, uh, the tissue um, was a little obscured, they couldn't see very well, they just need a better picture. Um, maybe they wanna add an ultrasound, maybe they need to add some special views. Fortunately, out of that group, only one, per, one to 2% of those end up having a biopsy, and out of the ones that are biopsied, about a third are cancer. So um, I think it's good to forewarn people that they might get a recall letter so that they don't absolutely panic when they get called back in. Let's tell them in advance. You know, they might need to just take another look. It doesn't mean you have cancer. So let's tell people beforehand so they don't get scared. Um, there are possibilities of false positives and false negatives. Um, no test in medicine is 100%. And so does mammography miss some cancers? Yes, it does. Does it sometimes find things that are little tiny things that maybe never would have bothered you in your whole life? Yes, it can. So there is some concern for overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Um, hopefully, as our screening methods get better and better, hopefully we'll find less and less of that. And certainly technology is improving and advancing all the time. Um, so I think that the kind of the take home is that we need to do informed and shared decision making. We need to start the breast cancer screening conversation. It's important to uh, teach women to be aware of their breasts and to promptly report changes or concerns. We should do risk assessments so we identify women at high risk. 
and we need to discuss some of the risks and benefits. But at this time, I think it's well proven that mammography is our best screening tool that is available at this time. So I think that uh, risk assessment is good um, and we need to do kind of a shared decision making. Um, it's important to do a history and physical also, a screening mammogram, this is confusion to patients sometimes too. A screening mammogram is done as a screening only if you have no complaints and nothing's found on your physical. If you have complaints, a new lump, new pain, discharge, or something is found on your physical exam, you have a skin change, you have a lump, you have some problem, then that is not a screening mammogram. That is a diagnostic mammogram. And certainly people um, get confused by that a little bit and they're coded differently and the reports come out differently. So it's okay to um, let a person know. And if it would happen to be a diagnostic mammogram, we need to inform the person that that is what they're having. So they don't think they're just having a screening. But I think that individual plan and developing it as a shared decision is very important. Uh, some of the breast cancer screening guidelines have certainly been confusing. They're confusing for patients, they're confusing for providers. And so um, just to show you, this is why it's confusing. You can see almost no wonder people are confused. Um, all these supposed expert groups, nobody can agree exactly on the same recommendations. The US Preventive Service Task Force has their recommendations. The American Cancer Society has theirs. The American College of OBGYN has theirs. International Agency for Research on Cancer has theirs. College of Radiology has theirs. College of Physicians has theirs. No wonder it is confusing. So I think we need to talk to patients and recognize that um, they'll have different, uh, if they look, there's going to be different recommendations. Um, I guess, uh, one of the things to do as a clinic is to sit down, I think, and decide as a clinic which one you wish to follow so that the clinic can be a little more uniform in what the providers are recommending to patients. So that's something that clinic by clinic and, and certainly in different programs, they may require one or another, but it's good to have everybody aware, aware and kind of have all your providers on the same page. So at different ages, there's different recommendations. Um, I guess in practice, I usually followed the American Cancer Society one. And they, you know, a lot of the differences aren't huge, but the current recommendation from the American Cancer Society is at age 40 to 44 to at least begin the discussion uh, with the option to the patient if she chooses to begin mammography to start then uh, from age 45 to 54 to offer a yearly mammogram and from 55 on to do a mammogram about every two years until um, the person reaches a point where they have a life expectancy. Of course, um, that's kind of a guess, um, less than 10 years. So if you have a person who is 75, but has many, many, many health problems, um, they may wish to say, you know what, I'm ready to stop mammography. On the other hand, maybe you have somebody 90 who is probably still mowing their lawn, they're living independent, they're, they don't take any medication, they're extremely healthy, and their odds of living to be 100 are, are pretty darn good. Well, maybe they do wanna have a mammogram. So again, uh, it isn't just knee jerk, it, it's a careful discussion with the patient and um, making a good informed decision. When a person has a mammogram, there's a couple different ways it can be done. I think traditionally it was a film screen mammogram. That was the original way. That's much like your film camera. It was a regular film. It had to be developed in a dark room. We had giant closets filled with old uh, films. Um, I think we all were very happy when the advent of digital mammography came. It was much like your digital camera in that you could have an electronic image, you could get away with the dark, you do away with the dark rooms, you could do away with these closets of, of stored films and lost films and whatever. And if you needed to send films, you could actually send them digitally. So uh, that was uh, certainly a great advantage. 
Uh, one of the newer techniques now is one called 3D mammography or tomosynthesis. You may have heard of that. And that uh, actually does some angled pictures in order to improve and obtain more of a 3D image of the breast. I think some things to uh, note are that every single one of those do deliver a small dose of radiation, although I've heard it to be about the same as about uh, four hours out at the beach in the summer, so not terribly high uh, radiation. All of the modalities do require breast compression, and the breast compression, I think when we explain it to women, a lot of times they say, oh my gosh, they're gonna squash my breast. And yes, a little compression is necessary. But I think the reason is really the thinner uh, you can get the breast, uh, sometimes the less radiation you need to use and the sharper the image. So I think when you explain it to women, they're usually quite willing to go along with that. And um, really all the methods use the same type of positioning. Uh, positions usually you take um, a screening mammogram usually has four standard views. So you do two top down and two kind of angled from the side. So the top down's called craniocaudal, side one is medial lateral oblique. The 3D um, mammogram again is one where they actually, if this is, if the blue area is the breast, the x-ray tube rotates an arc and takes a number of pictures so that uh, the computer then can synthesize the multiple images into a 3D image. The good thing about that is it is able to get rid of some of the recall rate because um, you uh, get less of kind of this, what's called compression artifact when things kind of get squashed on each other and it can almost look like a mass, but it isn't. So I think sometimes if you can decrease that recall rate, you can decrease anxiety, you can decrease your biopsy rate, and hopefully you can increase your diagnosis rate. Um, certainly in dense breasts, you get a clearer image and it's felt that it can increase the diagnosis of breast cancer and decrease the false negative rate. Unfortunately, it does have increased cost. There is some increased radiation because you take multiple images. And some people have even been concerned about, uh, does it cause overdiagnosis? Do you see more things uh, that ultimately aren't important? So that is being evaluated at the present time. And it's new enough that we don't know exactly what the impact on mortality is ultimately going to be. The craniocaudal view looks top down. And when you're looking at an image, the whiter area is more dense tissue. The um, black area is less dense tissue. So, and the breast is made up of, as we said, ducts and, uh, and uh, lobules and fatty tissue. And so, by looking at that pattern, then the radiologist tries to identify differences. They'll look from the top. They will look from the side. They usually like to compare with previous to see if there's been a change. And at the end, then the radiologist will give it a report. They will say it's a BIRAD zero, meaning um, something's unclear. Um, I want to get a extra image, I want to get a magnification, I want a spot compression, I want an ultrasound, but there's, it's incomplete. If a person gets a BIRADS 1, it's negative, that looks great, just come back for your next screening. If you get a 2, what it means is we see a spot, we've done an ultrasound, we're positive it's a benign cyst, go back to screening, that's benign. A BIRADS 3 is we see a little something, we think it's highly likely to be benign, uh, less than 2% with chance of cancer. And uh, we'll just bring you back maybe in a little shorter time. Maybe we'll see you in six months to make sure that that's not growing or changing. Um, a 4 will be suspicious, a 5 will be highly suspicious, and those are the people that most likely will undergo a biopsy. Fortunately, nowadays, most of the biopsies can be done with a needle, and so uh, you don't have to um, uh, go to surgery to have an open biopsy to get to the bottom of it. Uh, BIRAD6 is a person who has a known cancer and has been re-imaged for some other reason. Uh, breast tissue also is rated uh, by density. 
Um, all breasts are a little bit different. We inherit some of our breast pattern and then depending on some of our body weight and our age, um, some of our breast density might be quite different. And uh, usually it is classified either as fatty, average, dense, or extremely dense. And what that means is if it's very dense, um, it means it's a pretty solid white background. And it's kind of like trying to find the snowflake against the snowbank. It's very hard. There's not much differentiation between those. And this is an image that just shows you how uh, kind of the little, the differences for um, the level one has probably mostly fatty tissue. Uh, very hard for little masses to hide in that. But as you get denser and denser, things hide a little easier. And the reason that's important is if you look on the left side of the screen, you see a mammogram. But if you do extra studies, you can say, uh-oh, there's a small spot that's hiding in that. And it's a little difficult to see. And it's because of that dense tissue. Um, a number of states have actually legislated notifying a woman of her density. And in fact, um, the national standard, which is the Mammography Quality Standards Act, which is a national standard, um, in 2019 um, announced a proposed amendment uh, to uh, require reporting of breast density to patients and providers. I think some of the question about that is right now, though, that has been sort of a dilemma is that with breast tissue being dense, I don't think anyone has completely agreed about what you should do as your next step. Should you get an MRI? Should you get an ultrasound? Should you follow the person more closely? So while we notify people, the frustrating thing is we don't have a good answer for them about what to do from there. And a lot of the studies and organizations have just said, uh, insufficient evidence to make a recommendation. So that that often is one of the reasons that patients are confused when we talk to them and, and really rightly so. So hopefully that will be resolved uh, in the near future. When a mammogram is done, the radiologist is looking for things like densities, microcalcifications, and architectural distortions. Uh, densities usually show up as small masses. Microcalcifications often don't have a mass, but they sort of look like a starry sky of little tiny clustered calcifications. And the more what they're called um, uh, kind of uh, uh, pleomorphic means that there's, you see, if you look, they look broken. There's some big ones, little ones. They're kind of scattered all over. Uh, those are probably the most suspicious. Architectural distortion looks like something was uh, like a little scar or a puck or something's pulled in. So the radiologist looks, those are the signs they look for for breast cancer. There's a number of studies that can be done uh, that are also very helpful. Breast ultrasound is uh, really good. In fact, I always called it sort of like the, the ste my stethoscope to the breast. It was very helpful. Good thing about that is it's, um, does not use radiation. It can be used in very young people. Uh, it is very helpful and it can also be used for guidance for needle biopsies. Um, and as you look, you can see uh, there's a person that has a small density. Um, and if you look and it's nice and sharp and clear and uh, black in the center like that, uh, it's probably a benign cyst. You can sort of just let the person go back to screening. On the other hand, if it's irregular and tall and sort of raggedy looking, uh, it's highly likely to be a breast cancer and it probably needs to have a needle biopsy. Um, ultrasound evaluation, they look at a number of different features in making their recommendations. Benign breast cysts are pretty easy to find and they have very classic findings. Uh, breast cancers, on the other hand, are very tall and irregular. You can see how jaggy they look. They almost look like they're infiltrating. Breast MRI is one a study that is used primarily for women who are very high risk, certainly women who are, are known to be breast cancer gene carriers or close relatives of uh, women and men who are breast cancer uh, gene carriers. 
let's see. Well, don't go on that. Um, breast MRI, that's actually what a breast MRI looks like. Um, people have often heard about PET scans. Uh, PET scans are actually not used for screening. Medical oncologists use them very commonly, but they're primarily looking for metastatic disease. So they're not a very good screening test. So we don't usually use those uh, much in a screening program. And as you look, what they're looking for is hot spots. And usually in other places, you wanna look. There are fortunately a number of the uh, technology in screening is, ex is really exploding. And so I think that the future looks bright that we'll have some good tests on the future. Um, some of the contrast enhanced mammography is quite good. Uh, they're using some nuclear medicine imaging and um, a number of places, including Avera locally, are doing quite a lot of research on finding a blood test. And we've all thought, wouldn't that be a great day if a person could go in and have a blood test and have some of that identified just on that? Uh, that would be wonderful. So we're kind of uh, looking towards the future with optimism. If a person does have an abnormal mammogram, most of the time they will go ahead and have some additional studies. Uh, fortunately, most of the time, uh, the additional studies are done and it's noted to be benign and the person can just return to screening. On the other hand, if um, it is noted to be a cancer, it's malignant, uh, then what would happen is the procedure would be to go ahead and do the staging. That's really based on characteristics of the tumor, based on the size and whether there's lymph nodes involved and and is there any distant spread? At that point, it's very good to do multidisciplinary planning in a cancer committee where each discipline, be it surgery, or radiology, or medical oncology, pathology, um, all uh, weigh in on opinions about very best treatment. Are there clinical trials available? What are the options for treatment? At that point, then the patient needs to hear the recommendations. Uh, they need to be carefully informed about pros and cons of the different options. And then ultimately, the patient makes the final decision. And I can't stress how important that is that uh, women are the ones who actually make the final decision. I think the days of being told, hey, you got to do this, no questions, this is what you do. Uh, fortunately, I think those days are, are gone. Thank goodness. Women are much more in control of making their own healthcare decisions. Um, I think that they, as we looked on some of the other, the slide at the beginning, the cancer burden has been very great uh, in Native communities and not just breast cancer. Uh, when we look at some of the uh, data that comes out of, um, I, this is just some of the uh, data that they're able to get nationally, and they do it really out of the PRCDA counties, and so you can look at a lot of the other places aren't counted at all, so you can tell sometimes the data is a little, and that's just your preferred referred care delivery areas. So unfortunately, a lot of the data is a little spotty because you can see how much all the white areas really aren't included. So you got to be a little careful when you're looking at your data. When you look at the total percent change in cancer incidence, you can see that in really quite a number of cancers, the cancer incidence um, in American Indians, Alaska Natives is up, um, whereas in many other parts of uh, different socioeconomic groups and uh, ethnic groups, that it is decreased. Um, I think that uh, some of the alarming statistics are that in men, uh, the rate of lung cancer uh, has been up 12%, colorectal cancer 36%. Um, in women, we have found the rate of cervical and colorectal cancers higher. Uh, breast cancer um, in this study was higher uh, in certain parts of the country, whereas when we actually looked at some of the South Dakota data, that it was higher in South Dakota also. Uh, colorectal cancer seemed to be particularly higher in the Northern Plains. And so I think that's very a significant finding for this group um, to uh, be aware of. Um, and again, this is an incidence uh, slide. And you know, so often everything is lumped. And um, when 
in reality, the different uh, IHS regions are often quite different. You can see that there, there's quite a bit of variety, which is why I really liked the um, South Dakota Comprehensive Cancer Control Plan because it really was specific to um, this local area. Um, when we look just across the board at risk factors and what can we do to try and change some of those trends when we see the cancer in uh, American Indian Alaska Native populations, um, certainly we know that tobacco usage is high and we should do concerted efforts at um, uh, tobacco education and cessation programs. Uh, a lot of, uh, we know that our, some of our, our um, diet and uh, exercise uh, does play into a number of uh, different cancers. Uh, so decreasing uh, some of our sweetened beverages, access to much more healthy food is not always uh, immediately available. Uh, alcohol awareness and decreasing alcohol intake uh, is uh, important. Increasing physical activity to have people have safe, good places in order to get physical activity. That's not always present. Um, diabetes, um, obesity, overweight are risk factors. Um, exposures to carcinogens. Uh, viral hepatitis is known to increase liver cancer. Uh, Heliobacter pylori has been known to increase, shown to increase uh, stomach cancers. So what can we do? I think some of the important things are to provide culturally appropriate community-based interventions that, that really model healthy behavior. We do need to do tobacco prevention and cessation programs. We need to do alcohol prevention education, healthy diet education, um, education and understanding the benefits of screening. And then uh, very important is providing access to preventive health services vaccines such as the HPV vaccine, it's even talked about we could absolutely eliminate cervical cancer. And cervical cancer has been a major cancer burden in many of the um, American Indian Alaska Native communities. Cancer screening in many cancers, uh, breast, in colorectal, uh, prostate, those are all very important. We need to uh, improve our access. Some of the barriers that have been recognized are certainly lack of health insurance. Sometimes this has been very difficult for uh, people to afford these. Transportation's an issue. You know, many of the communities do not live near um, uh, many of the um, healthcare facilities and the screening facilities. Uh, cost is often a burden. Um, many times the clinics only uh, do eight to five and it's very expensive for a person to take time off from work. Some of the jobs do not allow that and taking a whole day off from work plus paying for uh, the clinic cost is a significant burden. For some people, language is a barrier. Uh, fear of pain and diagnosis, I think we need to work with people. Uh, we need to recognize and honor uh, different beliefs, uh, but work with them. Uh, I think it's been shown that working with some of the, uh, really the uh, respected uh, community leaders um, has been very effective in that. Uh, some people are just embarrassed, and I, I think we need to work with that and recognize that as a real concern for some people. Um, and, and do the most we can to make it an easier experience, um, have people educated as to what to expect, um, to respect modesty, and respect their requests as far as what happens at the clinic and during their screening. Um, some of the barriers that have been identified as barriers to mammography are sometimes the location and type of facility. They're often very far away. Sometimes they have very limited hours. Sometimes it's very difficult to make an appointment. Uh, sometimes you have long waiting room times. A person comes and spends a, a long time just wasting time. Um, I think that's one of the things that the Honorary Woman program is really so outstanding because it does use um, trusted community experts. Um, I think they are working very hard to eliminate uh, cost barriers. Uh, to um, eliminate uh, some of the transportation barriers. And I think also um, very important is it's a very dedicated staff. They do a lot of reviewing of reports. 
tracking of cases, making sure that follow-up is done, uh, referrals are done so people have uh, timely access to high quality. So I can't say enough about what a great program that is. So uh, I guess congrats to um, the staff that's doing so well with that. Um, now, just in kind of closing, I just wanted to point out a few things about, you know, what we're seeing about the effect of COVID-19 on cancer screening, not just breast cancer, but all cancer screenings. And uh, this is a um, graph of what happened to ambulatory visits in the United States um, in early April. You can see that uh, we were going along, you know, right, uh, kind of our baseline. And then really the uh, COVID-19 epidemic hit. And you can see that the ambulatory visits just plummeted. And you know, with those visits, there was a lot of uh, preventive health care that just didn't happen. Um, many of the vaccines didn't happen. Many of the screenings didn't happen. Um, when we look, we can see, and that wasn't patient's fault. That actually was a recommendation from the CDC. March 13th, um, a United States national emergency was declared. And, and actually it was recommended that people not go to a healthcare facilities for routine screening until further notice. So certainly elective care was postponed. And certainly people were afraid to go to clinics. They were most afraid to bring their children to clinics. And so what has happened is that we have noticed a widespread decrease in many, many of our um, preventive and screening um, modalities. And so um, these are some slides that actually I borrowed off of a, a, a I, uh, kind of presentation that uh, Tinka shared some of these slides with me. So I um, thank who, whoever uh, actually made these slides. I kind of borrowed them. But it did show that look at the extremely significant decrease um, that had absolutely, you know, over time, we've been uh, seeing a lot of our screening rates gradually go up and up and up and up. But unfortunately, now we're seeing about 83 to 90% decrease in breast, colorectal, cervical cancer screenings. We've also a very significant seen uh, decreases in uh, childhood vaccination um, and all the vaccines. So uh, that leaves many of our uh, children vulnerable to many of the infectious diseases. Uh, we certainly don't want to see uh, new outbreaks in uh, measles and uh, some of the other diphtheria, some of the other things. So. Uh, this, this is definitely what I would call kind of a pro public health crisis when we're seeing uh, these decreases. Um, and it was felt that probably over 22 million screening tests were disrupted or delayed um, at, for a very significant number of patients. And so when we've looked at uh, clinics, we have seen this pretty much across the board. And when it's calculated out, uh, we think that there are a significant number of people will, who will experience a delayed cancer diagnosis due to uh, not having their screening on time, which certainly was by recommendation. People were not having elective visits. So what do we do at this point? I think it's recommended that we make an active decision to resume our cancer screening. So we need to make our clinics uh, choose to um, make back on track a very high priority. Uh, clinics and healthcare facilities need to prepare careful, safe plans on how they are going to resume elective care in a very safe way, where we can be masking, we can be um, safe distancing, we can do um, extreme cleaning, we can do some spacing so people do not cluster in waiting rooms, there's a number of measures we can do to make sure that we can get some of our elective care back in a safe way. We also need to recognize that reopenings need to be a little flexible. We can't have a rigid plan. We might need to dial forward, dial back, so that um, if our numbers are looking pretty good, okay, we'll dial forward. Uh-oh, we're not doing so good. 
okay, dial back. So we need to be very vigilant about following what our local situation is and responding to it. Um, hard to set certain dates like, okay, by um, November 15th, we're gonna do this, or December 1, we're gonna do that. Well, that may not be real. We need to um, be very flexible in this. We need to be very careful about safety precautions. We need to um, educate our patients and staff about our safe, um, our kind of our safety precautions, and we need it. Need carefully. As we start bringing people back, we probably need to do some prioritization. We can't bring everybody in um, on day one. And so probably if we have some high risk people, we need to make sure we get them in right away. Or people that maybe had a questionable finding and then that just got, their workup got stopped. We really need to prioritize getting them in and getting them evaluated. So anyway, that's kind of the conclusion to all this. And, and I, I think overall, I'm optimistic. I think there's a number of uh, very good programs. I, I have really had nothing but respect and admiration for the Honor Every Woman program. And uh, so anyway, I, congrats to the people who are doing that. So, and then um, I would say in conclusion that uh, cancer incidence is a sig very significant burden in American Indian and Alaska Native communities. And that cancer screening is important for early detection and uh, it definitely decreases mortality and that providing cancer prevention education and access to cancer screening should be a very high priority for all healthcare facilities. And getting back on track now uh, post COVID-19 should also be a high priority for healthcare facilities. So anyway, and with that, I will close and I think I do have a few minutes. I, I uh, hopefully didn't run too far and uh, would be very happy to take questions. Wow, thank you so much. That was a very thorough and informative presentation and we are just appreciative of your time today. And uh, we do have a few minutes for um, some questions. So you can either uh, post those in the chat box or the question box and I can read those aloud. Uh, and then I also wanted to let you know that a copy of um, the presentations is in the handout section of your control panel. Either it was clear or everybody's completely confused. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm just trying to figure out. Okay, I, I'm I'm bringing the questions up now. Okay, so there. There's a question from Melinda Balderas. Uh, do you see portability screening buses will be used more for rural areas uh, to be reintroduced post COVID? Um, I would definitely hope that that uh, gets back on track because um, I know most of them were stopped during COVID but I think that that answers the transportation issue. And so I think if we can do this safely, um, I, I think that that would be a great thing. I, I think that healthcare facilities are looking at that now and uh, right now um, numbers seem to not be so good. So I don't think that's gonna happen until we start bringing some of our numbers down. Um, I have been very impressed with a, a number of the reservations have taken uh, very good, in my opinion, extremely good measures in, in uh, masking and limiting access that, um, you know, I wish more of the state would do. Uh, but I think at this point, um, probably bringing an outside van in uh, might not be the very best idea, but I would certainly hope if we get a hold of our numbers, which I think should be coming, um, that that would be definitely a target and a goal to get back on track. Thank you. And uh, we just have a couple of uh, comments, I guess. Um, Jackie Rhodes said, thank you, Dr. Milroy. Excellent presentation. Your passion and clear recommendations are wonderful. And um, Mel Melinda Balderas also said, uh, great presentation data and experience. So. Um, thank you very much. Um, any other questions? We we do have a few more minutes. 
I can also unmute or we can also unmute you. I don't know that I know how to, but <laughs> um, I have unmuted all. I can, I can un unmute everyone. So those that um, have a question and I unmute you, just be sure to self unmute yourself if you choose to ask a question over your microphone. Thanks, Eugene. It looks like there's another question from Jackie Rohde. Okay. Kelly? Uh, is there any material for back on track marketing to patients and providers that you know of? Um, you know, I, I tell you, I have a, I, I should have done more looking at that. I recently gave a HPV talk and I know that the HPV round table came out uh, this summer uh, with a really good presentation called Back on Track uh, that mm. was really quite good. And that was primarily aimed at vaccinations. But I think a lot of that would probably apply to cancer screening. And so I know that there are some very active, like the colorectal round table. Um, I haven't checked them specifically, but I bet they will come out with that. I think the HPV Roundtable's uh, presentation was called Back on Track. That's on the website. It's very clear. Just to, um, go to the HPV Roundtable. And um, I think that they're planning. Uh, some of that was aimed a little bit more at the summer, but I believe that there's one in, uh, in progress right now to be aimed more for now. But I, I think that that overall had some excellent um, ideas, real specific ideas that we could probably apply to cancer screening also. That's great. That's fantastic because I know a lot of our clinics are are trying to get back on track and and uh, raise awareness for for patient education and outreach and and you know get get back on track for their screenings. So. Yeah. Yeah, I was really impressed with the publication. It's very thorough and has a, a lot of real good practical advice. So that'd be one to pull up and, and uh, review. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Tinka, I know you had a question. Did you want to ask ask it? I did. Um, we're kind of short on time, but maybe you can. Where is it? I wrote it down. Um, can you just quickly, and know we're a little short on time, talk about, um, so I'm all confused about breast dense tissue and um, who's, what recommendations, I think there's probably varied recommendations on what type of screening for, if you have breast dense, um, if you have dense breasts what type of um, recommendation for type of screening you should get. Can you talk about that kind of in a quick um, synopsis? Yeah, I, I tell you, you are having the same question that everybody, uh, patients and providers are all having. But I think right now, if a person has dense breasts, it's probably um, you have to recognize that um, false negatives are a little higher in that they just don't see as well. Um, I would say it's very important to have a 3D mammogram if you can versus just a standard mammogram because that is particularly good for dense breasts. By doing those angles, you kind of get rid of a little of that, what's called compression artifacts, kind of like an accordion where you squish everything and you can kind of make some false spots. And it also makes it a little difficult to tell a real spot from maybe a false spot. So if you can possibly have a 3D tomosynthesis mammogram, that is very good in dense breasts. Um, the argument about what do you do from there, it has been so far, at least from the preventive service um, task force has been said, insignificant evidence to recommend any further step beyond that. So I think part of the problem with kind of releasing the letters to tell people is, of course, we worry them and, and then we say, well, now we don't know what to do. Um, but I certainly think that careful breast awareness, um, prompt reporting of symptoms, and a 3D mammogram is probably your best bet right now. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't see any other questions out there for you. So again, thank you so much for your time today and, and presenting on the on the material. And um, 
especially since it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and, and we're trying to promote that. So um, thank you very much. Well, thank you. I was honored to be asked, so thanks. All right. So next we will be going to, our next presentation will be on Better Choices, Better Health Workshops in South Dakota Tribal Communities. And I'd like to welcome Richard Mousseau, Vicki Palmruder, and Jackie Rode. And I think I just made Richard the presenter, so should be good to go. Awesome, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, and I will, I believe everybody can see the PowerPoint. And so I'll be kind of tag teaming this. Um, I think Jack, uh, Jackie Rohde will actually be taking the lead um, and we'll kind of go over a little bit more of our positions and roles, but I just want to give you a quick introduction. Um, so my name is Richard Musso and I work with the Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board, um, kind of help with a lot of the chronic disease self-management education programs and uh, we'll be talking about uh, those programs and I'll go ahead and let um, Jackie introduce herself and if uh, Vicki um feels feels like uh, introducing herself as well well good afternoon everybody i'm jackie Rohde. i am in fort thompson on the crow creek reservation and i serve as a master trainer um, and lay leader for some of our chronic disease self-management programs including uh, chronic disease self-management chronic pain and diabetes um, and i've also served as moderator on several of our virtual workshops Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vicki Palmreiter. I am also a master trainer for the Better Choices, Better Health program located in Rapid City and partnered with Jackie and Rody on the diabetes tribal pilot that they'll be talking about. And I'm, I apologize that I'm feeling under the weather today. I've got sick kids at home and it apparently has hit me as well. So I'm going to let them kind of run the show here, but be available for questions if needed. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Vicki. And just take care of yourself and feel better. Um, so we're going to talk today about how we expanded our chronic disease self-management uh, programs to remote delivery in response to COVID-19. Um, so Richard, if you want to go ahead and advance. And this is just a slide um, that we're required to put in by SDSU, uh, just explaining our non-discrimination um, policies and that we comply with all of the um, non-discrimination policies for the South Dakota Board of Regents and the South Dakota State University. And if you want any information on that, uh, the information um, resources are provided there on the slide for you. Want to go ahead and advance? And so first we want to talk about, well, what is chronic disease self-management programs? Um, chronic disease self-management programs were first created uh, out of Stanford University a little over 30 years ago and it was out of a research-based project. So from that project came some evidence-based programming um, to improve health outcomes for many chronic conditions. And these included workshops for people with chronic conditions uh, and also specific workshops for HIV, chronic pain, diabetes, cancer, and caregiving. Um, and so the licensing organization is actually Self-Management Resource Center, which is located out of California. Uh, they oversee the actual licensing of organizations to deliver the programming, and they can also train leaders. And then licensed organizations can also offer uh, those leader trainings, appropriate certifications. Um, and so what is the actual program? Well, it's workshops that are in small groups, uh, usually depending on whether it's in person or the format, eight to 12. Um, and those workshops are peer led. And so that's what's different about the CDSMP model. It's not an educator coming in and telling you, this is what you have to do, but rather a peer leader that generally has either a chronic condition themselves or lives with somebody that does um, and walking you through together this evidence-based programming where the participants really make the decisions for themselves and are learning the skills. Um, and so if you're not from South Dakota, because I know that we have some folks that are on the call that are not, 
Uh, the link you see on the bottom here is a link to Self Management Resource Center, and it can give you a tool to find the licensed organizations in your area that can deliver workshops and programming. Um, and that link, if you go ahead into our resources there in the chat and download the PowerPoint, you can just press Control and click the link, and it'll send you right to that site. And there's going to be a couple of other links in our presentation similar to that as we go along. So if you have any questions, um, you know, about that, just feel free to ask and we can we can certainly um, address that. Uh, go ahead, Richard. So what is Better Choices Better Health South Dakota? Well, Better Choices Better Health South Dakota is the branding that we have for our South Dakota licensed um, chronic disease self-management programming and it is licensed through SDSU extension and we're supported by the South Dakota Department of Health and the Department of uh, Human Services and all of our programming is offered at no cost to participants. So we started programming in 2014 and at that time it was strictly face-to-face -face, uh, with volunteer and sponsored leaders like myself and Richard that were serving as really the outreach to the communities and you know, doing that one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, marketing and delivering of programming in our communities and partnering with one another in other communities. Um, and we also have a video that we created uh, in 2018 just to kind of showcase um, really what the diabetes program itself looks like. So I know we're a cancer workshop today, but really we have a diverse group of programming. And so this gives you just a little snapshot at what it looks like. Living with diabetes, these feelings may be familiar to you. There is a better way. Better Choices Better Health South Dakota offers free workshops for adults coping with pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes, providing tools, advice, skills, and support. Visit betterchoicesbetterhealthsd.org. It's time to take back your life. My apologies for the technical difficulties, everyone. Yes, this uh, go-to webinar is I think getting all of us a little bit, yeah. but you can also click that link in our PowerPoint um, if you'd like to go back and rewatch that at any point. Um, like I said, all of the links in our PowerPoint, uh, you can just hit that control button and click the link. Um, so if you want further information on that afterwards. And I think we're into our next slide here and feel free, uh, Richard, Vicki, jump in here at any point if I if you need to, um, or if there's anything I miss. But uh, for right now, as we've transitioned, so we talked about how all of our programming was face-to-face. -face. Um, we had to start, you know, with COVID-19 addressing how do we do workshops uh, in this new landscape. And so we kind of have two um, modalities. One is our BCBH Live, which we will, you know, talk about a little more in depth here in a second. Um, but that is our Zoom uh, feature of our workshop. So it's traditional workshop over Zoom. And within that, we offer cancer, thriving and surviving, uh, chronic disease self-management, chronic pain, diabetes, small steps to healthy living, and take a step and walk with ease. Um, so oftentimes, I think we've had a couple workshops now where we've paired uh, things like chronic pain with walk with ease. So we might alternate on Tuesday, Thursday, for example. So some of these can actually pair with each other as well. And then our BCBH at home, which is a telephone delivery version uh, where we do a conference call uh, once a week with participants. And within that set, we offer chronic disease self-management, chronic pain, diabetes, and walk with ease. And so we'll dive a little bit more in depth of what this looks like here. And so for our BCBH Live, which is our Zoom version, 
It's our traditional six week workshop that we would have delivered in person, but it's now delivered virtually through Zoom. Um, and we meet for six weeks for once a week. Uh, the traditional curriculum was two and a half hours, but we shortened our break time. Virtually, we found that we didn't need that much break time as we do in person. And so it's around two hours. Um, we have about six to 12 participants in that workshop. And when participants register, they'll either call our 800 number or our link to our website, and they'll get hooked up with um, Bridget Montefiore, and they'll make sure that a book and a CD is sent out to participants before the workshop starts. So since May, when we started virtual delivery, uh, we've had eight workshops completed and two currently in progress. And I think we, we just started a cancer um, workshop recently on the 20th of October, as well as a diabetes workshop. Uh, we've had 45 participants. We've had 82% of those participants be um, completers, which means they've attended four sessions or more. And the curriculums are offered include chronic disease, diabetes, cancer, chronic pain, and we will be having worksite chronic disease starting in November as well. And then for our BCBH at home, which is the telephone version, uh, this is a conference call, as I mentioned, and it meets over the phone for once a week. Now here we have a smaller group of maybe four to six participants. Again, they're sent the materials beforehand and they can go through these on their own time and then jump on the conference call once a week to kind of go through materials and get support. Um, and since May, we've had three of those completed with one in progress, eight participants and 75% of those have attended four or more sessions. And we have done chronic disease, diabetes and chronic pain um, or chronic disease so far and then diabetes is in progress and chronic pain will be starting up here at the beginning of November. And now, how did we actually get started um, transitioning from in-person to what we just explained? Well, actually before COVID started, uh, we started with a virtual pilot of our diabetes program uh, for tribal communities. This was something that was being talked about for maybe a year or so uh, before we actually implemented it, uh, coming out of the need to really reach our tribal communities and some um, barriers we were facing with being able to get enough leaders in tribal communities because you need two facilitators for a workshop. Um, and so we, we were working on this uh, virtual pilot and that happened in May 11th and we offered our very first workshop over Zoom. And uh, we had that for tribal community members, participants uh, from Crow Creek, Oglala, and Flandreau tribes were all involved in that uh, first pilot. And as we mentioned, the, the planning actually started pre-pandemic. So in that particular workshop, we had 11 participants that registered. Seven of those were completers. They attended four or more sessions and four were attendees that attended less than four sessions. Now, we actually had two participants that probably would have gone on to be completers, but they had job responsibilities with contact tracing. And so as COVID was gearing up, they actually had to uh, drop out due to those responsibilities. Um, so that's really impressive to think about. This is the first um, virtual pilot that we delivered and to have this much of a completion and participation rate was really amazing to see. Um, and one of our participants uh, here from Pro Creek, uh, Steve, gave us this quote that uh, the workshop gave him a lot of insight into his health and well-being. And what really helped him, um, in particular, he was in the diabetes workshop, was learning to watch his labels. He learned how um, to notice the trends that he was having, that he was eating too much salt. And the menu planning activities and portions were very important to him uh, mm -hmm. in really learning those skills um, to be a good self-manager. So that I thought was a very good testimonial. And he's actually someone that has been both in our in-person workshops and now in our virtual workshops. So I thought that, that was a very, a very good look 
at kind of the impact that the virtual delivery has had. So as we've transitioned, um, we've had to really look at how do we do that? And the first thing we did was we uh, started with, as a team, Richard, Vicki, some of our CHWs that were involved, um, other leaders, we would get on these weekly Zoom meetings and they were really planning sessions for us where we would just go through the different activities of the workshop, figure out how to adapt it um, to the Zoom and really practice the Zoom features. You know, as we've kind of learned here with GoTo and, and the experience we've had with this conference, sometimes, you know, this technology can be tricky. <laughs> and so uh, we really found that having that time as leaders to really just practice the features and how do you screen share, how do you whiteboard, it was critical to the success that we later had with the participants. The other uh, thing that was very critical was having trained leaders that acted as tech assist and moderators. So, for example, when I was moderating, I would have my program script next to me. I would be in the background with my camera off and I could handle things like the screen share, the chat, uh, whiteboarding. We do a lot of brainstorm activities and so putting those on on whiteboard. And what that did was that freed up a leader like Richard to be able to just focus on delivering the workshop and facilitate. And that model really worked well for us. Um, so if any of you are looking at, you know, transitioning programming to remote delivery, that is a, a big best practice that we've learned. Um, and then also having, like we mentioned, the pre-session planning, but also post-session debrief. So you get done with the session, you know, we might spend 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, just going, hey, what worked? What didn't? What do we have coming up next session? Who needs to do what in terms of, you know, screen share, brainstorm, that kind of thing. Um, and then one of the other things um, I kind of took on as a tech assist and as a leader was just really reaching out to our participants. So, you know, we had a mixture of, of people in terms of some people had never done anything on the computer before. Other people were really comfortable and they did it all the time. And so what I would do is take our participant roster before workshop started and just call each of our participants and reach out to them and say, you know, hey, um, I'm the tech person for the workshop you have coming up. Just want to see if you are comfortable with Zoom, if you have any questions. Is there anything that I can walk you through or help with? And if they weren't comfortable, um, just going ahead and maybe setting up a practice session with them to get on Zoom. Um, and so, you know, that these were the strategies we found were really best practice in our transition. And of course, I mentioned we did a virtual pilot. Well, the virtual pilot hit at the time that, you know, the pandemic uh really had started to hit in march so we had this pre-planning before march and then we were looking at launching right as things really got rolling and so once covid really kind of changed our our realities it expanded what we were already doing and so within 60 days really of kind of that mid-march shutdown that everybody remembers we were implementing remote delivery of workshops um, so that's that's really an amazing thing to think about. Um, and then, as we talked about Self-Management Resource Center, the people that have developed the curriculum and licensed us as leaders, they, um, talking with leaders in other states and programs that were doing the same thing and asking to do the same thing, they then developed guidance for virtual and telephone delivery. And so a lot of that best practice that we learned ended up being in the guidance. Um, and that's not just us, it's all the programs across the nation that helped contribute to that. Um, and SMRC developed a telephone toolkit version, which we've talked a little bit about, of chronic disease, diabetes, and the chronic pain programs. Um, Richard, you, or Vicki, do you guys know if they're planning on uh, doing the toolkit uh, with cancer specifically? So just the other day, um, I heard from Dr. Kate Lorig, who's the founder of the program, and she said that they are going to be surveying the current license holders 
that offer cancer thriving and surviving to determine if there's going if there's a need or if they feel there's a use for the toolkit the telephone delivery model for the cancer program so we'll we'll know probably in the next month or so if if they're going to move forward with that excellent Thanks, Vicki. So, you know, if you've got patients specifically, you know, looking at cancer, um, we do offer it through the live, the Zoom version, and hopefully, you know, we'll see if there's a need um, to do it through telephone as well. Um, one thing I wanted to mention um, is that also uh, through this pilot, but just in general, um, you know, through the Zoom platform, it's nice that people were also able to use either their iPhones or iPads um, and SDSU extension was uh, very generous to assist some of those individuals with being able to check out those iPads. And so being able to have those types of resources um, and that flexibility really helped to reach a lot of that rural population in our tribal communities. So that was one thing I really wanted to mention when, when looking at uh, this platform um, is just, how flexible it really can be and how nice it is. Yes, and that's an excellent thing to bring up. Thanks, Richard. My uh, little kitty here is going to join in for a little bit, it looks like. Um, you know, that's the key I think we've learned throughout COVID, many of us, is flexibility, right? Um, I think with all of our programming and in our experience, I think in probably your experience in your programs, being creative and being flexible is really the key to success. Um, and that was one thing I was very, very grateful for SDSU Extension to provide. Um, one of our community members here was able to take advantage of the iPad and it was actually his first experience with an iPad. And so to see him go from zero to, hey, I really like this thing. I think I wanna get one of my own. This has been a really you know, good experience is another success story in itself, for sure. So, um, let's see our next, you're kind of getting a little little heavy on time, I think, Richard. Um, so kind of, you know, we've, we've touched on some of this before, so I'll kind of breeze through this here a little bit, but uh, troubleshooting and addressing barriers, right? We've, we've all seen it. With these virtual platforms, we're gonna have some barriers and some things that crop up. Technical glitches, as we mentioned, access to technology is a huge issue. So programs that can, you know, provide the iPads, for example, like Richard mentioned, or, you know, thinking about infrastructure and Wi-Fi, um, how do you get Wi-Fi to people? Maybe if they don't have access to internet, can we direct them to the telephone version of the program? So having these dual modalities um, can also address that barrier. And then, of course, you know, one of the big challenges always is lack of awareness. I hear often from community members that we just don't know what's out there. Hey, I didn't even know they were doing that thing. Um, and so really having people in the community like myself, like Richard, that just are talking to our community members every day and mm -hmm. saying, you know, hey, do you know we have this programming available? And of course, that's more challenging right now. You know, social distancing. I know myself um, with my health issues. I'm I'm being very cautious, but to reach out to our contract health folks, make use of um, email chains to send um, you know info like this uh, that Richard just popped up there. Uh, just make use of all these different ways to reach out to your community. Um, can you go back one sec, Richard? I just want to make sure I covered everything there. Um, yeah, um, and then the last one I, I see here is just also um, being aware of low bandwidth issues. So you might have a participant that, you know, is having trouble. Um, asking them to turn off their camera will help save the bandwidth. Um, and also just being prepared, you know, like we were today to switch things up on the fly. Um, as a team, Vicki, Richard, and I are kind of used to just flipping back and forth and communicating really well when things crop up. And so, um, you know, just having that teamwork is really, really important where you can trust your, you know, each other to have everything prepared to be able to just be flexible. Um, and then just being really purposeful and having real conversations. 
I think that's a key. You know, a lot of times in the community, I think we get program heavy. And so sometimes just talking to somebody and saying, you know, I know that cancer can be scary and you don't really know what that means. You know, like, what do all these big words mean? Um, I don't know if this is helpful for you, but hey, there's a resource here where we can get together over Zoom and we can learn about it together. You know, just in that real way, um, I think is incredibly powerful. Um, and just remembering that, you know, I think as providers, as program folks, just have real conversations with our community members. They really need it and appreciate it. Um, and so moving on here very quickly, uh, help us get the word out about our programming. What you see on the right hand of your screen is all the current workshops we are offering. Um, and there are links on the left hand side here. You'll see under our live, uh, which is our Zoom, and our at home, which is our telephone version. Each of those links can send you to register. Um, and again, you can click on those in the PowerPoint. And if you have any uh, people in your service uh, area or that you work with who might be interested in any of these workshops, please steal shamelessly and pass the word along. Um, and then next slide. I, yep, and then this is the future. Uh, so what is coming up? You know, this is what we've done. What are we gonna do next? Well, uh, SMRC has started to train master trainers like myself to now deliver leader training. So training new leaders for workshops uh, virtually. We can train them over Zoom and you can deliver virtually. We've adapted the full four day training into 13 Zoom sessions. So it's six weeks, twice a week for two and a half hours. I know that seems like a big commitment, but you're talking about like a full four days of packed content to teach you uh, to be a leader. And so, you know, stretching that out kind of they've found works. They're committed to continue these workshops after the pandemic. So even once we get, you know, to a place where COVID is, is reduced and we're able to be out more, we're still going to offer virtual delivery and telephone toolkits. And anyone now can join these evidence-based programs from the comfort of their own home. And we are also committed to continuing to reduce the barriers for our rural and tribal populations, increasing access for new leaders to be trained, and providing participant accountability and structure to help increase people's confidence in their own health management. So I think that's all we have. Um, and then these are our contact information if you want to reach out to any of us with further questions or information. Is there anything else, uh, Vicki or Richard? I think you did a great job covering it all, Jackie. Yes, way and to rock right it. Great job. And uh, right on time, apparently, so. <laughs> yes, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Richard, Vicki, and Jackie. That was a great presentation with uh, a wealth of information on, you know, the, ability you know to adapt and you know go virtual which is you know what a lot of us are you know i think jackie you hit it on the nail we got to be creative and and adapt and be flexible in in our learning processes now that you know it's not always possible to be in per learn in person anymore and and this might be our new reality so um so thank you for your presentation um, I am not actually seeing any questions. Um, just a reminder, you can ask a question in the question box or the chat box as well. And, and a reminder that the handouts, or you can download the handouts in the, in the uh, control panel of GoToWebinar. Kelly, there are a couple comments in the question. Okay, could you, I don't see those. So, so could you possibly read those? for me please um laura hawkins says great presentation um melinda baderas balderas says thank you all for the information thank you all the information is so helpful we're all going through 
the creative learning curve with with technology zoom and other options great information thank you and again if you guys have any questions please feel free to reach out to vicky richard or myself uh, vicky is a wealth of information when it comes to really the ins and outs of um day-to-day -day programming so feel free to to reach out to us if you guys think of anything there is one more part to melinda's aca has a safely resuming and promoting cancer screening during COVID-19 pandemic and also up above there was um oh I'm sorry that was from Kelly Mand never mind we're good thank you thank you all right well thank you all for being a part of our virtual conference and um we will be moving on to our next presenter uh our final presentation today will be from Ashley Kitchen on worksite wellness hi ashley how are you today good how are you good i am working on that you should have presentation mode now okay and i will let you take it away okay awesome thank you okay let me see let me get my camera hi everyone so my name, um, as Kelly said, is Ashley Kitchen, and I'm a research associate um, at Asset Inc. located in Minneapolis. Um, so first, I want to say thank you to the Health Board for organizing this conference and also all of the other presenters for, you know, sharing their stories and their knowledge with everyone. Um, Asset and the Health Board have had you know, a more than six year partnership and working relationship. And I am currently a part of the evaluation team um, for the Great Plains Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program, um, also called the Honor Every Woman Program, um, which seeks to increase um, breast and cervical cancer screening rates in Great Plains tribal communities. Um, so this, sec this session is, seeks to intr briefly introduce um, you all to the idea of worksite wellness um, in order to kind of promote employee health and well-being. Um, this session will also discuss the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's um, worksite health scorecard that helps to assess um, an organization or clinic's capacity to implement a worksite wellness program um, that includes activities such as prevent preventive services and training and tools so let me get my slides to work okay so um, as stated by the cdc workplace health programs um, refer to a coordinated and comprehensive set of strategies, which include programs, policies, benefits, um, environmental supports, and links to the surrounding community designed to meet the health and safety needs of all employees. So, um, you know, the CDC, as they state, the workplace is kind of an important setting for health protection, um, health promotion, and disease prevention programs. So on average, um, Americans working full time spend more than one third um, of our day, five days per week um, at the workplace. So workplace health programs can help lead to change at both the individual level and then also at the clinic or organization level. So workplace programs um, can help reduce health risks and improve quality of life in addition to lower direct costs, such as insurance premiums and workers' compensation claims. So some examples of workplace health policies um, might include um, giving access to local fitness facilities, whether those are on site or providing um, like a reduced cost for like a gym membership, um, tobacco free campus policies, um, making healthy foods available, and then also employee health insurance coverage for preventative um, screening, so such as breast and cervical cancer screenings. Um, so this is the CDC's workplace health model, um, and it is made up of four different steps, as you can see. So we have assessment, um, planning and management, 
implementation, and then evaluation. So the remainder um, of my time is kind of focused on the CDC's worksite health scorecard um, manual. And so this manual is an assessment tool um, and it's free to use that helps to promote employee health and well-being. So the tool can be used kind of throughout the workplace. Things just die already. So this tool can be used um, throughout the workplace health model by helping employers assess, um, you know, at the beginning. So help employers assess whether they have the capacity um, to employ a worksite wellness program, or it can be used sort of later in the workplace health model to assess whether, um, you know, workplaces have implemented strategies to improve their employees' health and well-being. So it can be used kind of at any step um of the workplace health model like i said it can be used at the beginning to kind of gauge um, your capacity to implement these strategies and it can also be used you know at the middle to kind of assess and evaluate how the strategies implementation is going um, and then it can be used obviously you know towards the end um, either yearly or something like that so this is an example of what the CDC Worksite Health um, Scorecard Manual looks like. Um, it is ki kind of lengthy, um, but it can be done in multiple um, sittings. So there, in total, there's 154 questions um, organized across 18 different modules. So these modules, like I said, can be completed um, in any order at separate sittings, um, and these modules are scored to kind of help employers identify gaps um, and, and track your improvements over time um, once you implement these different strategies. The scorecard, as I said, can also be used um, at the beginning of a pro or at the beginning of your worksite wellness um, journey in order to kind of assess your capacity to see whether or not um, these are strategies that you could implement. So I have um, a, these are the 18 different modules listed here. Um, so I won't go through all of them, but some of them include um, organizational supports, tobacco use, high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol, physical activity. So there's a bunch of different um, modules across the health spectrum. Um, and there is a module specifically also on um, cancer. And I have put the link um, in the slides. So I know they're available in the handouts tab um, of the GoToWebinar control panel. So if you download the handouts, you'll be able to click on um, that and it will take you right to the health uh, scorecard. So this is an example of one of the pages here. So this is the background and community engagement um, information section. And this is a section that is sort of optional, um, but it is helpful in um, kind of capturing background information about your clinic or your organization and your employees. Um, so some of the questions asked are around employee characteristics, um, organization and program background, and community engagement. So you can see the first page talks about, um, you know, asks the number of employees in your organization, if you have multiple work sites, um, you know, your percent of male and female, if known, um, your percent for age groups, average age. Um, so it's kind of um, just something, like I said, to capture background information about your work sites pop population. Um, so while it is, um optional it is something still that could be useful in looking at what you might be able to offer your employees depending on this um background and community engagement section so this is um, an example of what one of the modules looks like so this is the organizational supports um, module and it breaks it down into various um, different 
sections within each module. So the first section is on leadership commitment and support. Um, the second section is on measurement and evaluation, and then it goes through um, other sort of topics as well. So what we have is um, questions around the past 12 months. So if you're doing this sort of as a capacity assessment and like the first step of the workplace health model, um, you would want to look at this and think about the previous year. Um, and then obviously once you start implementing any strategies, you would, you would think back to the previous year as well. Um, so while you might be taking this for the first time and thinking, well, we didn't implement any strategies yet, that's okay. Um, you can check no for all of them and that will give you your baseline score um, so that you can sort of target the areas that you want to improve upon for the next year um, if you complete the scorecard again. So the questions, um, you know, sort of revolve, these questions specifically revolve around um, you know, did your worksite demonstrate organizational commitment and support of worksite health promotion at all levels of management? Um, you know, and then you would include sort of, do they, does your worksite include references to improving or maintaining employee health and safety? Um, did your worksite have a strategic plan that includes goals and measurable organizational objectives um, for the health promotion program? So these are going to be questions that revolve, um, as the module states, around organizational supports. So once you get into more um, of the modules, there will, they will have specific questions around those. And again, you can mark yes or no. Um, it tells you how many points to give um, yourself, and then you will be able to add up your score. So each of the um, scores will go here. So as you can see on the left, all of the modules are listed. It gives you the total possible points and then it gives you your um, your worksite's score and then your percentage of total. So it'll give you a percentage um, there as well. So the scorecard, um, as I said, is intended to kind of help assist in prioritizing strategies both short and long term. So once you are able to go through these questions and the scorecard and kind of score your organization's um, um, commitment or strategies for worksite wellness, you will be able to then look at and see how best you could um, prioritize different strategies that you're interested in looking at. And the inter the cool part about um, this, as I said in the beginning, is that you don't you can do these modules at different sittings. So you don't have to do them um, all at once. You are able to do it, um, and it can be modified so you can kind of make it um, what's going to fit your organization best. So if you're looking specifically at cancer, you might only want to score um, on the cancer questions. And that's okay too, you can do that as well. Um, so different steps I've listed here to help assist in evaluating your scores and then taking action. So once you decide, okay, we wanna evaluate or assess our worksite health policies, um, this sort of gives you the steps um, to take action next. So what the CDC recommends is using your scores as a planning tool um, again, so to prioritize your strategies, both short and long term. Um, and then you're going to want to also find some way to assess your employees' needs. So maybe your employees um, aren't as interested in the fitness facilities, but they might really want some extra um, PTO time to go and get a cancer screening. Um, that can be something too that you can do. You can create some sort of like survey or assessment of, um, you know, a list of, of um, popular worksite wellness strategies. And then you can have your employees sort of take a survey on what's most important for them. And then you can kind of score it that way um, to help you prioritize your strategies. So you can do it that way. Um, you can seek resources and technical assistance. Um, the CDC has um, an entire 
section of their website dedicated to worksite health and worksite wellness, um, which is where the scorecard comes from. So the scorecard is one um, sort of tool that they have in terms of worksite health and worksite wellness. So the CDC is a great um, resource for that. Um, create a baseline report. So that would be doing this uh, CDC scorecard would be an example of a baseline report. Um, so getting that foundational, um, those foundational scores are an important sort of um, step in taking action. Um, next, you can educate your employees about the health promotion program. So if you are going to be, um, you know, starting this or doing the scorecard, let your employees know. Tell your employees, get them involved, get them excited about, um, you know, possibly the strategies or the different outcomes that might be coming. Um, so you could tell them, like, we're working on, um, looking into worksite wellness policies, um, you know, and get them sort of excited and knowledgeable about this program um, and any strategies that you might want to implement. Um, and then the last sort of step that the CDC recommends is to complete the scorecard yearly. So what you're going to want to do um, is do that scorecard, get your baseline, and then every year after that, you can take the retake the um, assessment, and then you'll have a way to evaluate and assess your scores over time and how and assess sort of how your clinic or organization is doing um, on worksite wellness and promoting worksite health. Um, so this is an example of the worksite. Um, health scorecard um, online portal. So as I said, it's not necessary to complete the entire scorecard. Um, you can complete the sections that are of most interest to you, but if you want to use um, the online system that I have shown you here through the CDC, you do have to complete um, all of the modules to receive your organization's benchmark report. Um, so if you do, if you only want to do a couple of the modules, you can do um, the scorecard and then keep track of your summary of scores like I showed you on the previous slide on that chart. Um, but if you do want the CDC to kind of um, create that baseline report or that benchmark report for you, you will have to do the entire um, scorecard. So the um, annual benchmark reports will help you track your growth over time in various areas that you prioritize. Um, it, the online portal also allows you to save your information electronically and then access your reports electronically. I know that it might not be um, something that is accessible for everyone. And again, that's why they kind of offer um, the paper version. And if you do have the capability um, to use the online portal, um, they give you that option as well. Again, it's free. Um, you know, in this, of course, this isn't, if this isn't possible, like I said, you are able to track your progress over time by filling out the summary of score sheet um, on the previous slide. You would just have to keep track of that um, manually and not necessarily um, in this portal, but you can keep track of it um, on your own as well. Um, and then at the bottom of the screen here, I have the link to the direct um, to this portal entry um, page. So if you download the handouts, again, the link is in there for easy access for you to be able to look at the online portal and sign up if you want to um, and get started. So there are also resources available, as I said, on the website. So when you go, when you get to this website, um, you can get the scorecard PDF. You can download um, a sample worksite health scorecard report. So it's around four pages or so um, of your summary benchmarks. And then it's also detailed by topic area and module. So it'll give you an overall or an overall score, and then you can look at each individual module scores as well. 
Um, and then it will also provide you with a registration and submission checklist to make sure that you followed all of the steps to get um, kind of an accurate report. Um, and then you can also export the report um, to Excel or save it as a PDF. So if you are using the portal, but you don't always have access um, to the internet and you wanna make sure that you always have access though to your reports, you can always save them as an Excel file or as a PDF. Um, so once you receive your report and or total your scores, depending on um, the method that you use for scoring, um, then you can start identifying which areas you would like to um, improve on and strategize which of your priority areas are there going to be. Um, so this on the left is an example of the CDC um, worksite health card. So this is an example if you um, do go ahead and use the online portal. You can see here that this is a sample summary benchmark report. Um, so you have all of the modules here and then you have the points possible and then your score. And then you can see on the top right that it says right there to export to Excel or export to PDF. And then so the higher point values indicate that a strategy is both effective and then strongly supported by scientific evidence. So it's likely to yield the best results. So again, the higher point values indicate that a strategy is effective. Um, so what you wanna also do is consider costs, um, ease of implement, when you're deciding on what priority areas you might want to um, make, you know, whether you wanna, what, what strategies you would like to implement. Um, you might want to consider cost um, and ease of implementation and then also your organization's needs. So again, assess, um, you know, your employees, what they would like, what their needs are, um, what would be most beneficial to them. Um, so once you receive your report or total your scores, um, these are some steps that the CDC recommends um, for next steps. So those include identifying um, which areas could be improved the most. Um, so you might want to identify these areas, but just because they those areas need to be um, improved the most, that might not mean that that's what you want to prioritize. You might want to prioritize areas that um, would take maybe the least cost amount or um, might be the easiest to implement. So it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to start with the strategies um, that need to be improved the most. That's not necessarily where you have to start. Um, you wanna consider whether a particular strategy um, is feasible for your organization. So some strategies might be just sort of um, either going to be too expensive or too hard to implement, or your employees might not um, have indicated that that would be something that they wanna focus on. Um, that's okay too. So you want to consider that. And then you also want to consider whether the strategy will address your employees and health needs and interests. So again, uh, um, evaluate and assess what your employees needs are. Um, because if you sort of implement strategies without taking that into account, um, they might not take advantage of these strategies. Um, and then that would be sort of, you know, not cost effective. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily improve your employees' health outcomes. Um, and then another next step would be to sort of draft an action plan and a budget. Um, you know, how much time um, and money do you have to allocate towards these strategies? Um, and how much time and money do you have to allocate towards even doing the assessment? Um, so that has to be in the conversation as well. Um, so the scorecard manual also includes um, resources for action, and then also a glossary to sort of aid in understanding some of the terminology. So some of the terminology that the scorecard um, has within it might not be something that, you know, you're familiar with. So they do provide a glossary to sort of understand the questions that they're asking. Um, there is also uh, the scoring methodology, so how they sort of arrived at what scored um, higher and what scored lower, and then also sample templates for um, like action plans and things like that. 
so that is all that I have um, for you guys today. So thank you very much for listening. Do you guys have any questions? Yes, we do have a, a question, Ashley, and thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and for taking time out of your day to be with us again today. Um, this question comes from Tracy Bono. I have struggled the past few years trying to implement worksite wellness utilizing the CDC scorecard. Local health departments are not wanting to utilize the scorecard as it's too large or long for worksites to fill out. Do you have suggestions on best ways to get a worksite to fill out the scorecard? Um, I think it might be something worthwhile maybe like i said the survey you don't um that you don't have to do every single module so it is um really long i think i said 154 questions or so um so i think that you know if that burden is too um big and too time consuming i definitely think maybe um looking at those different 18 modules and i can um put those back up here on the screen for people to see. Um, so maybe taking a look at the different modules and deciding, you know, if whichever ones you they would like to um, sort of score or look at. I think the organizational supports one is a good one to look at because it's sort of just general questions about the organizational, the organization's support of worksite wellness in general um so that one might be a good place to start i think it's around it's 25 questions so it is um on the longer end for the modules but i think that um that one's sort of just a general uh, module that sort of looks at general worksite wellness and organizational support for implementing those strategies so i would say maybe try to it's going to be case by case, but I would look at and strategize around maybe which modules might be um, most effective to start with and not asking people to fill out um, the entire scorecard. Thank you. Um, last, we can, we still have a little time to take a couple more questions if there's any out there. Um, Eugene or Tinka can also unmute. The lines if you would prefer to verbally ask your question. Um, I know uh, for our program um, we've been working with Ashley actually to uh, see I guess reach out to some of our uh, partners and clinic facilities uh, for the um, cancer module and um, try to develop a worksite wellness policy around cancer screenings and and um, implementing policy at at the uh, clinic level and so um, we we have we are familiar with this which is why we had asked her to to make a presentation on this because it, it I, I think it can be beneficial and useful a useful tool And I'm not really, I'm not seeing any more questions. So uh, thank you, Ashley. Yeah. yeah, thank you guys for um, asking me to do the presentation. I hope it was helpful. Um, as I said, my presentation should be in the handout section. So everything I've kind of linked um, in there for people to kind of access. And um, if you, is your contact information on your handout? um yes it should be on my first slide on the first slide of the presentation oh, perfect so if you have any questions for ashley or want to follow up with her via email please feel free to reach out to her yep definitely all right well with that um we are going to oops there was just one other comment um from melinda Bader balderas says very helpful and thank you nice thank All right, I am going to 
we're going to move on. Um, Tinka has put in the chat box the link for the evaluation. And I will show you what we will be drawing for. Can you all see my screen? This very nice Pendleton weekend bag. Very pretty. Yes. And uh, just as a reminder, I don't, um, if you weren't on earlier, the winner for the day two drawing was Marlene Shortbull. So we send out our congratulations to her again. And now if uh, the prevention staff want to get on um, online with me and show your videos, uh, we will go ahead and close for the day for the year, actually. <laughs> Gina and Deanna. Oh, there's Deanna. They're coming, Gina. slowly but surely. Um, and just FYI, um, we will be notifying the winner uh, for today's drawing. We'll notify you via email, and we'll send out that email tomorrow. And then, Eugene, were you going to send out um, the link in email as well, just in case people aren't able to access it through ch the chat box. Yes, I'll be sending out the link for the for the evaluation. Perfect. Well, we've had three days of pre presentations packed into just seven and a half hours, and we are very pleased that all of you could join us virtually for the 2020 Great Plains Partners in Cancer Screening Virtual Conference. We are thankful to each and every one of you as attendees, and as well, we extend um, our gratitude to the pre presenters for sharing uh, the wealth of information, and we look forward to a better 2021 and hopefully seeing you all in person at our next conference. We'll, we'll cross our fingers. Um, but I wanna uh, wish you all a good day and be healthy be safe and take care of one another. Midaki Oyasi. Thank you, everyone.